Welcome to the Global Prayer Network with Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We pray this teaching will impact your life and bring you closer in your walk with Jesus. Let's get ready to receive today's teaching from Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Truly, it's indeed a delight and a pleasure to be with you once again for this noonday hour. Amen. God is good. He's awesome and he is mighty. I'm going to give you a few minutes to take a moment to do your text evangelist work, as Bishop would say, and reach out and invite someone to join you in the midst of this time of sharing. This is the day that the Lord has made. And he says from the rising of the sun to the going up down of the same that his name is worthy to be praised. Amen. This is a good day to be here on this broadcast. We want to thank Bishop for allowing us the opportunity to teach in his absence. Amen. We also want to take the time to continue to pray for him and the entire Latte family as they are going through bereavement. We also want to lift up those others that we are um, knowledgeable of who have loved ones that have gone home to be with the Lord. Truly, we know that it's a time that we all can empathize with, amen? Because anytime that you are having to say goodbyes to someone that you love that you know will no longer be on this side, although we know that death is not the end for us because as believers, we live again, amen? But we want to keep them lifted up in prayers. We want to continue to pray for our missionary supervisor that God will continue to strengthen her and keep her. Amen. Amen. Now that I've gotten all that out the way, let us go to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find favor to help us in our time of need. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Eternal and all wise Father, it's right now, God, that we, your children, come humbly to your throne of grace and mercy. God, we want to thank you for this new day that you are painting. Oh, God, you told us, God, and everything we are to give thanks for is the will of God in Christ Jesus. God, and we come thanking you, God, for another opportunity to share. Thank you, God, for waking us up today. God, thanking you, God for another opportunity to be amongst the believers. Oh God, it could have been another way, but yet you saw fit to bring us here at this hour. Now, God, we ask that you give your word success. We ask God that you allow me, God, to be an instrument, a vessel for your use. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be acceptable in your sight, oh Lord, for truly you are my strength. You are my redeemer. This we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the blessed Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Well, this week we've been talking on the subject that Bishop has been dealing with, Master Keys to Elevated Prayers. Master Keys to Elevated Prayers. And we began by sharing with you that the 10th key of effective prayers is grace. And we went on to share with you, what is grace? Most of us can uh, define grace as the unmerited favor of God or the mercy that God shows towards us. It's the grace that is undeserved. It's the grace that's unconditional. It's the agape kind of love. That's the kind of grace that he gives us. And it's the favor of God. But you recall that I pointed out that I wanted us to look at it from the lens of the divine influence of God upon our hearts, so much so that it reflects in our individual life. And yesterday we focused more importantly on prevenient grace. And we spoke that prevenient grace is what comes before the civic work that is transpiring before we even know it is happening. Moreover, God seeks us in whatever ways that he chooses because he loves us and he sent Jesus to restore the fellowship between us and him. We pointed out that Philip Yancey says, there's nothing that we can do to make God love us more, but equally so there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less. And we pointed out that prevenient grace transpires when God infiltrates 
our minds, our thinking, our feelings, and gives us inspiration to want to be in relationship again with him, to be reconciled. So he seeks us out, gets our attention, and draws us back into fellowship with him through his son. And he intentionally reveals to us the love that he has for us that's embodied in the promise of his grace, which is his son, Jesus. And God will continuously seek to restore fellowship with us until we fully come to the understanding and we fully comprehend by responding to his acceptance of the free gift. And we know the free gift is Jesus Christ. So today we will focus our attention on another grace, justifying grace. Whereas prevenient grace, God is reaching out to us. God is seeking us. God is setting things in order in our lives to help us become more aware of the gift of grace that he extends to us through Jesus and to demonstrate God's love. John 1 and 14 says this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. We pointed out that the first thing we must come to know and to understand is that grace comes to us through, through and by Jesus. Not only that, John 1 and 17 informs us for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 and 2 said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Justifying grace then is how God provides us the opportunity to place our faith in Jesus and be reconnected to him. Jesus is God, so to speak, in the children's terms. He's, uh, he's God's show and tell. You know, they show you something that they tell you about. Well, Jesus was that for God. He came to establish a relationship again between us and the Father. So my sisters and brothers, Luke 19 and 10 points out that the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So it's not our fault that we are born into sin. It's not our fault that we were born disconnected. It's not our fault that we are born lost. Therefore, God in his infinite wisdom and his love towards his divine creation takes the initiative to seek us and to reconcile us back to himself. It's not God's desire for any one of us to remain lost. We were born into what we have come to term as the original sin, the sin that Adam and Eve created, committed in the Garden of Eden when they ate of the fruit that of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told them they should not eat. But the tempter beguiled Eve and she told her, told her husband and he ate. And therefore they became disobedient because they had done that which God had told them not to do. And therefore everybody was born into this lost state. We're disconnected, we're separated. And, and we have to remember that although we can be a good person, we can do all the right things, we can be kind, we can be helpful, we can be loving, we can be caring, we can seek not to hurt anybody. And we can do all the good things, but we're still disconnected if we haven't come into a relationship with the Father. And therefore, that means that we have to accept and respond to God's provenient grace, which is his seeking us out. But how do we re respond to his provenient grace is through 
his justifying grace. You say, how is that? By faith. Faith is our justifying grace. Let's look at the story, and we're going to spend a great bit of time in this story found there in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, and we're going to read through the 21st verse because that all encompasses what we're going to deal with today. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, but no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Verily I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? No man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth not, believeth not is condemned already because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation of, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh into the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. So clearly we see here a dynamic here. Nicodemus is a ruler, comes to Jesus by night and has this conversation with Jesus. And during this time, Jesus in, in interjects, as you would say, the concept of being born again. The way that we are born again is when we are born of the spirit of God. When we allow God's spirit to have full reign in our life, when we allow God's spirit to lead us and guide us into his truth. It is in other words, when a person gets reconnected, when that which was disconnected becomes connected back to the source. And that's when we learn what it means to really be saved, believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. See, when an individual has faith and believes in Jesus, then they have been reconnected in fellowship with the Father through the Son. And this is an eternal relationship. 
Jesus instructs Nicodemus to tap into pervenient grace. As he has come to Jesus, and now Jesus tells him to reflect upon all the miracles, all the teachings that he's been privy to hearing and the things he's seen done at the hands of Jesus. And then Jesus instructs him that you must be born again. In other words, Jesus was saying to him, you have to respond to this calling. You have to respond to be saved. This is the first call that we must accept. Being bought into relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus. This is justifying grace. And once Nicodemus does this, he's connected to the Father forever. You know, we always speak on John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But we skip over most of the time that 17 verse. For God sent not his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came and died so that everyone, not some people, everyone has an opportunity to be re reconnected to the Father forever. Therefore, one comes to know and to understand that when we use the term, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and by fire baptized, we are really speaking of the justifying grace of God. Because after our confession of faith, we are no longer disconnected or lost, as you would say, but we've been reconciled. We've been brought back into right fellowship with the Father. More importantly, we can take confidence in Jesus. Why can we take confidence in Jesus? Because Jesus is trustworthy. The scripture says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So what does it mean for us to trust in the Lord? Well, trust means to put your confidence, your belief, to know someone is honest, to know someone is a person of integrity, to, in essence, to say that they are tried and true type of person. And this type of relationship can produce security in your life. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with someone and the relationship is always fickle. One day y'all best BFFs and the next day, you know, y'all not getting along. The next day, something else. It's always something. As believers, we have a consistent avenue, a consistent connection back to the father. So what do we see in this story? First, we see that Nicodemus identifies Jesus as a teacher that come from God. He also acknowledges and recognizes the truth in what Jesus has been teaching. So by him doing that, he recognized the provenient grace of God, that God was reaching out to him through Jesus, telling him to recall all of these things that you both seen and that you witness, recall those things. So God was reaching out to him. God was giving him the opportunity to walk in a life. All of us are given an opportunity to walk in a life. The scripture says that many still love darkness. What is that saying? Even though we have an opportunity to be in right standing with God, we love the world and the things that the world have to offer us more than we desire our relationship with the Father. But Jesus came as the light of the world in order that we might be taken out of a place of darkness and begin to enjoy his marvelous light. Not only that, 
Nicodemus believed in Jesus, justifying grace that is reaching back and giving a proper response. Jesus' action demonstrated for us, or to Nicodemus, that he was one that truly could be trusted. It is during this conversation with Nicodemus that we do find that most prevalent quoted scripture that informs us that any one of us who believe in Jesus shall have everlasting life. Thus, the reward for us believing is that we remain eternally in relationship with the Father. It's not an easily broken tie. The thing about it is we have to choose to believe in the Son or we have to choose to reject and not believe in the Son. Let's look at how all this works. In Luke chapter eight, verses four through 15, and we're gonna tie these two passages together by God's grace, amen? If you look at Luke chapter eight, verses four through 15, it says, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trodden down and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell amongst thorns and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he that have ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, what might this parable be? And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that are able to hear the word. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They are of the rock, are they, which when they hear, they receive the word with joy. But these have no root which for a while they believe and in a time of temptation, they fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart having heard the word they keep it and bring forth with patience. Hearing this parable of the seeds talks about the soil. The soil is the window of our heart. That place where I said that divine grace has an influence on our heart and thus it's reflected in our lives. So the seed is the word of God being sown into our hearts. The scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So every time we hear the word, it's an opportunity for seeds to be planted in our lives. But what makes a seed grow, a seed to grow? If a plant is not properly nourished, it will die because a plant needs both water and nutrients in order to survive. Many of us that grow our plants, we use a fertilizer called miracle Grow. Why? Because it has all the necessary nutrients and it has the ability to keep the soil just right in order for the plant to continue to grow. Well, the same way it is with us as we hear the word of God. 
We need to make sure that our hearts are saturated enough in the word of God that as the word is going forth, it has a proper place in order for it to be planted. Because if the word is planted in our hearts in a proper good soil, then it's going to produce some fruit. The scripture says a hundredfold. That means you'll be able to hear, not only hear the word, but you can be a doer of that same word. So let's, let's break it down a little bit better. Jesus was a teacher and he taught the people so that they could come to an understanding of who God is. Not only does he teach them who God is, but he taught them about what grace is. You say, how so preacher? Well, the mere fact that he was willing to die for us shows us that he came to show us God's grace. He became the promise of grace for us. He died a cruel, cruel death so that you and I might be able to inherit eternal life. It gives us the opportunity, my friends, to respond to God's gift. Now, one must understand, we don't sow the seed. God is the seed sower. He's the one that's sowing the seed, amen? He sows the seed in our lives. You know, that's through that witness that somebody, somebody comes up to you and they wanna talk to you about the Lord and sometimes you have time and you wanna discuss and other times you don't have time. You know, don't you remember back before you got saved? Cause you know, uh, when we were, weren't saved, you didn't really want to hear all this Jesus talk all the time, right? But the thing about it is, that was God's provenient grace working in your life then. You might have didn't understand it. And that's why the scripture tells us we'll understand it better by and by. Because now you're hearing a message entitled uh, Justifying Grace. And you come to understand that you were in God's provenient grace and you didn't even know it. That's why he said, even while you were yet lost in your sin, he had died for you and me. But the responsibility that we have is to make sure that our soul is right for the master to use, that we have good soul in order that the word of God might be able to be planted in that soul. Look at it here. The seed can be sowed into a heart that's not right. And what happens? They hear the word. The devil comes, steals that word from them. It's trampled upon. Or the word is sown into the heart. And what happens? The word is choked out. I mean, the word is eaten up by the birds. Or the word can fall amongst the rocks. You have a soul something growing in the midst of rocks, it's hindered by what? The rocks, the hard structure. It pre prevents it from growing properly. And so while you may get a little twig out, you never will get a fully grown plant. Also, when it's thorn sown among the thorns, the thorns, they choke out that which has already been planted. But the seed that falls in some good soil, some soil, soil that's been cultivated, some soil that's been nurtured. And that's, that soil is your heart. When you are staying in the word of God and you can realize and you can know and you can tell people that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When you can tell them that you know to, that you have to study to show yourself approved, a workman that needed not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. When you realize that it's the word that's able to cut, but it's also the word of God that can come back and heal you. That's when you know that you got some soil that God can come in and he can bring you good news and it's able to be planted in your life and produce some fruit. And that means that it'll produce in you what the word of God has purpose for it to produce. If it's change that's needed and you hear a word that's speaking on something that truly you know to be changed, need to be changed, then the word of God is able to quicken in you and cause you to be able to make the necessary adjustment. So what am I saying by all of this? 
regardless of what kind of soil you and I have right now at this moment, that this word is being sown into, God is going to continuously seek us to be reconnected if we're disconnected or if we're lost. He's not going to give up on us. Now, we may turn our back on him. You know, we talked about that yesterday. But God is going to continue to seek us out like that lost sheep. You know, that shepherd left the 90 and 9 to go after the one. Or that woman that lost her coin. She swept the house, cut on a light, swept the house and kept seeking until she found the coin. Or even that son that was lost. The father was watching, sees him afar off. And as he sees him afar off, he runs to him. Why? Because he was watching prayerfully watching, waiting, anticipating his son's return home so that he might be accepted back into the family. The last thing I want to cover for us today is that there are some benefits that are associated with justifying grace. What are those benefits? John chapter 14, 25 through 27 tells us, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've commanded unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We often use these words at funerals when people are at a funeral setting and we want to comfort the family. But these words are also words of affirmation for those of us that are believers. Because he's telling us, he's giving us peace. You know, sometimes the pressures of life, and as the scripture says, those things, those riches, those pleasures in life, sometimes it's, it's stopping the word from being able to have good soil, this thorn, because we're thinking about all of these other things and they're consuming us. And we don't realize that we have peace when we tap into God. What have I learned in the 55 years of my life? I've learned that I can have peace in the midst of a storm. All hell can be breaking loose around me, but I, I'm still going to stay with God. It doesn't matter what people say. It don't matter what people do. Why? Because I've learned that I can trust in him. He is my shepherd and I don't have to be in one. I've learned that I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and know that he's right there with me. I've learned that no matter what befalls me, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor is see begging for bread. What can I tell you this afternoon? Jesus is trustworthy. If you place your life in his care, then he's well able to keep you until his return. These verses inform us that since we have God's justified grace by faith. We also have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we are able to stand. And this is supported by Romans chapter five, verses one and two. It says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So one of the benefits we experience from being reconnected to God is peace. We no longer have to feel like we are abandoned, like we are alone, 
like we're in an island by ourselves, like we don't have anybody. Once we accept Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we have been reunited with the Father. And therefore, we are never, ever alone again. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. According to Romans 15 and 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 5 and 20, 23 and 24 reminds us, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. If God said it in his word, you can bank on it. Our God can do anything that's written in the word of God. The thing is, as long as our lives are in alignment with him, once we come to a saving knowledge or a believing knowledge in Jesus Christ through justifying faith, then we can ask what we will according to the word of God and we shall have it. What does it say? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find, knock and the doors will be open to you. But you have to do what is necessary to have that peace. What does it mean for us to have peace then? Well, to have peace means that peace exists where there is a connection between two things. If you look at a husband and wife team, now if you're in a house with your husband and y'all not getting along at the moment, there is a disconnection in the communication. But by law, legally, if that's your husband, that's your wife, you're still connected, right? But when the communication lines are broken, there's a tension in the midst of the house. Or it doesn't have to be a husband and wife team. It could be a, a, a parent and a child. It could be two friends. But once the communication has been torn down or broken, it creates a sort of tension because the two things are no longer connected properly. And therefore, we're experiencing what we could call a disturbance in the midst of that relationship. Well, that's how it is with us when we're outside of the ark of safety. There is a disturbance in our life. We can't quite find how we can have that peace of God that he says is supposed to surpass all understanding as we keep our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. So, we are, we're experiencing this and we have all these disturbances going on. But when peace enters, what was chaotic now becomes peaceful. What was in calamity is now being brought back together. See, when you experience peace, you'll be calmer. You'll understand what it means to be slow to sweep, speak and swift to hear. You'll understand what the word is saying when it says do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You want to understand what it means when it says, if you want to have friends, you must first make yourself friendly. See, when we are born, we are disconnected. And this disconnection causes disturbances. It causes unrest and we are not connected to the source of power. However, when we respond to the justifying grace of God, then we are now reunited. We are now reconnected. We now have peace with God. And we now can say, I have his eternal rest because he'll eternally give us eternal life. And because of this reconnection with the Father, we can now say that we are children of God. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption 
whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children of God, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also, also glorified together. Isn't it a marvelous thing to become knowledgeable of this great love that God has for us, that he's willing to bestow upon us as his children? Isn't it a great thing to know that we have a heavenly father who will look past our faults and still seek to meet our needs? 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. That's good news. Therefore, as children of God, we share a divine connection to our heavenly father who is constantly working in us until he shall appear again. Therefore, we can call ourselves a part of the family of God because we've been accepted as his sons and his daughters. As children of the most high God, we become his descendants. We are his, his heirs and we're joint heirs with Christ. We are blood relatives. You know, some of you may be wondering, how am I blood relative of Jesus? Well, when you accepted Jesus, the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, that blood that came streaming down, it was a cleansing blood. See, with our families, if people in our family, they act up and they give us trouble, what do we do? We, we put them out the family, so to speak. We say, we're gonna excommunicate them or we're not gonna have anything to do with them any longer. But being that we are bloodline related relatives, what happens? Although we may have put them out and we might not be talking to them, the blood is, st is still your relative by blood. You can't change the DNA that you were born into. It's still your relative. The same way it is with us when it comes to God. Once we accept Jesus Christ and we accept it into the body of Christ, we are connected to God by justifying grace and we become blood relatives and it doesn't change. As a part of the family of God, we are afforded the opportunity to be a part of a family that shows us unconditional love, that gives us a safe place we can run into, that is a predictable relationship that we are accepted in. And it's a place where there is security. Now we might not have those in our natural family, but when we are part of the family of God, the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary brought us back into fellowship with God. And that means that even if your earthly family is all jacked up, you have a heavenly family, a heavenly family that's built in God, hallelujah, that there is no incorruption, that you can go to a place and you can find somebody that will accept you just as I am without one plea, but that that blood was shed, shed for me. We have to know that we know that we are part of the family of God. There are some benefits to this justifying grace. And the last benefit that I want to talk about today is that we have a right to eternal life. When Jesus came to this earth and God gave him as a ransom for us all, that was God's provenient grace. But it says, whosoever believeth in him, that's God's justifying grace says we will not perish, but we'll have eternal life. So clearly, once we respond 
to God's beckoning call upon our lives through prevenient grace, by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, his justifying grace, we are able to receive eternal life. That's a promise. That's a benefit. We'll live again. Death is not the end for us. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 1 and 2. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many matches. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. We have peace. We have a family that accepts us. And we have received eternal life that brings us security. These are all benefits that our physical money cannot buy, nor can it obtain. These benefits are only available to us through the justifying grace of God. Faith in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. This, my sisters and my brothers, is amazing grace. Would you not agree with me? This is what God gave me to share with us today concerning his justifying grace. And tomorrow we'll pick up God willing and talk about his sustaining grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching and make plans to join our live audience on Zoom each weekday at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time. Log on with Zoom ID 898. 0388-5432 and enter password 821074. Visit us online at www.sethlardy.org and please remember to subscribe to this channel.